Morning, everyone. Welcome to White Branch this morning. Uh, we're going to start our service off with some opening music. Our beautiful wife, Jenny. We're going to start with Great is Thy Faithfulness, Brian's favorite. Yeah. <laughs>
Scripture reading today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Some of you might say, I thought we had that scripture reading like four or five weeks ago. (laughs) We did. Always good for uh, children to hear this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. (laughs) For this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. (coughs) Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So this was sent to me, kind of roundabout. But I'm going to share this. So the new CEO decides it's time to rid the company of slackers. On a tour of the facilities, he notices a guy leaning against a wall. The room was full of workers. Seeing a chance to show that he meant business, he says to the guy leaning against the wall, how much money do you make a week? A little surprised, the young man says, I make $400, why? The CEO says, well, right, wait right here. He walks back quickly, hands the guy $1,600 in cash. Here's four weeks pay, now get out and don't come back. Feeling like the boss now, CEO looks around and says, does anyone want to tell me what that goofball's job was around here? From across the room, a voice says, pizza delivery guy from Domino's. (laughs) Thank you for sharing that with me. So today we're talking about holy fathers leading holy families. Our whole series this year is on holiness, being set apart for the purposes of God. And I want to talk specifically today about the role of fathers and how important that role is for the family. From June 20th, 2016, Nick Cady wrote a blog, and it was the impact of kids on dad's faith and church attendance. So it's the impact on kids of dad's faith and church attendance. Since according to LifeWay Research Group, Father's Day is the holiday with the single lowest average church attendance, this is across America, statistically lower than Labor Day, Memorial Day, and even the 4th of July. As shown by today, we had a few of our fathers not here. So this is interesting when you consider that Mother's Day tends to be, on average, the third highest church service attendance after Easter and Christmas. Now, I would love to see that change. I would love to see Father's Day in the top five and just add Pentecost in there, okay? (laughs) So Mother's Day is one of the highest attended Sundays. Father's Day was one of the lowest. Scott McConnell of LifeWay Research says, clearly, mothers want to be present for the affirmation typically offered in most churches. But families also want to be present because their attendance, they know, will honor their mother. The difference in Mother's Day and Father's Day is telling, McConnell says, either churches are less effective in affirming fathers, or families believe Christian fathers don't value their participation the same way in worship services. Now there's other factors. He talks about Mother's Day is usually while there's still school in session. Father's Day is during the summertime, and often people are traveling or going on vacation or doing other things. But these factors aside, There's still something striking about this when you see the research and impact of a dad's faith and the practice of their families. So today I want to talk about the importance of that role, and in this article it continues. Statistics have shown that if a dad in a family is a true believer and a true spiritual leader, then the whole family is much more likely to be true believers than if just the mom. According to data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. Amen, that's so true. If a father goes regularly, regardless of what the mother does, two-thirds to three-quarters of the children will be worshipers as adults. That shows the difference between the two. If a father attends irregularly or even 
uh, somewhat regularly, between half to two thirds of their kids will continue that practice with some regularity as adults. So if a mother does not go to church, but a father does, a minimum of two thirds of their children will end up attending church. And another survey found, if a child is the first one in the household to come to faith in Christ, there's 3.5% probability the rest of the house will follow. So the impact on the rest of the house is minimal. If the mother becomes a Christian first, 17% will likely follow. However, if the father is first, 93% will likely follow. Those statistics are just to show you the impact of that on the rest of the family. And ironically, <laughs> I was hoping, you guys can pass this along, maybe you're watching it online, to pass along how much I wanted to commend some of our young fathers for being here regularly yes. and not here today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the three Ds, David, Dustin, and Daniel, thank you so much. <laughs> and I hope you're here sometime for me to affirm you again. But I really do want to say that I appreciate how much and how frequently and how regularly they have been here. And I know that that makes a difference on their families and uh, leading them and guiding them in that way. So God's plan for man. This is what I want to talk about. Specifically, yes, man. I'm using that specifically to speak of men today. In Acts 16, we see this take place. Uh, the jailer was there watching and guarding Paul and Silas. And, of course, they were praying, and God shook and then they got out, the jailer's about to kill himself. They said, don't do that. We're still here. And the jailer invited them to their home and said, tell me how to be saved. So in Acts 16, 31, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But notice this last phrase. You and your household. You and your household. It shows the significance of dad. Shows the significance of the husband and the father. Because when he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he was able to then lead the rest of his family. Acts 16, 32. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all of his household were baptized. Again, I believe he led the way in that. He was the first one to come to faith. He was the first one to be baptized, and the rest of his family Followed him in that. Acts 16, 34. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So I want you to see the impact there from that example. That's an example in scripture of the impact of dad and his role and his faith and him being the leader. Genesis 17, 5. No longer would be called Abram. You will be named Abraham, for I've made you a father of many nations. Now, some of you may have grown up singing, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord and do goofy stuff, right? Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, whatever. <laughs> Wag your tail, stick out your tongue. All right. You're like, we don't have tails. I get it. I get it. All right? But it's funny for not having a tail, someone sure wants to whoop it. Right? <laughs> I don't have a tail. I'll whoop your tail. And that's why I don't have one. You already whooped it off. All right. Genesis 17, 5. This is redundant. I want you to see it's redundant, but he's making a point. What is Abram's name? In Hebrew, the names have meanings. His name actually literally means exalted father. Abraham literally means father of many. So who did God call to start this line of faith? He called a father. One whose name actually literally meant father. I don't think that that's coincidental. I think God had a plan and a purpose in naming the one who was going to be so crucial to the faith, a father. Genesis 18, 19. What does he call him to do as that father? I'm calling you as a father, Abraham, 18, 19. I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. What did he call him to do? 
to direct his children and his household after him to follow the way of the Lord. I don't believe that's coincidental. God had a plan in calling a father and saying, I'm calling you to be the father to pass on your faith to the next generation so that this can be a household of faith. That's God's plan. But anytime God has a plan, Satan has a counter plan. Anytime God has a plan, Satan likes to thwart that plan, attack that plan, steal that plan, kill that plan. So Satan realizes God's got a plan to work through fathers. So Satan says, I want to attack boys. I want to attack men. And we see one example of that in Exodus 1.15. Exodus 1.15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth and delivery stool, you see a baby as a boy, kill him. Now, if it's, a, if, it, if it's a girl, you can let her live. You see right there, now obviously this is leading to Moses, and Moses was God's plan at that time to save the world. Similarly, later, when Jesus is born, the king Herod, just like Pharaoh, wants to kill the boys to and under because he doesn't want the man to rise up and be the savior. So we see, though, that there's this idea here, this is an example again, of Satan trying to attack boys and attack men. And Satan continues to want to destroy and attack boys and men in our culture. And God has used all kinds of ways to do that in all kinds of different cultures. Well, let me name a few of Satan's <coughs> ongoing attacks that he likes to use. One is to get men, instead of using their strength and using their role for good, to use it for negative. To use it to abuse. To use it to misuse. To use it to harm people and, and defeat them and destroy them. Including sometimes the very spouse and children that they are called to love and protect. Another one would be through divorce, adultery, to break that covenant with that family and with that spouse and to leave them and therefore become absent from the family and not fulfill that role. Or you could be technically still married, technically still the husband and the father, but you're not there. <laughs> you're not doing that role. So God calls them, and Satan uses these things. This is Satan's attacks to destroy that family. Sometimes it comes in the form of making the idol of success, or making the idol of work, or making the idol of the career. Now that's important, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But to put it in a wrong place, where that takes you too much focus, it's another attack of Satan. Another one, of course, is just flat-out abortion. This takes men and women out, but just like Exodus 1... Men are not even coming into the earth in several instances because they're getting taken out before their life even begins. And then LGBTQ, all the things that are going on with that movement. I believe part of that attack of Satan is to take out men from being men and fathers from being fathers, confusing gender, confusing roles, and not allowing them to be what God has called them to be. So let's go now to, I believe, God's plan for that as a creation, number one. Men were created to be male. Now, that shouldn't be a hard thing to understand, but in our culture right now, because of what's going on, it's become hard to just say that simple phrase. So in Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make mankind or humanity in our image, in our likeness. We'll come back to 26 in a minute. And then 27, in his own image, he created them male and female. Two genders, two distinct people, two distinct roles. So the first thing God has created men to be was to be male. And then the second thing was to be leaders. Now again, men and women both have a sense of leadership. Look at Genesis 1.26. Mankind or humanity, all is created in the image of God. All have rulership over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock that move on the ground. But I believe that God had a special leadership role from the beginning put into all of us as males to be a leader. A leader of someone, something, some group. Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. I believe there's an innate desire to lead. And then in 1 Timothy 2, I'm going to bring up probably one of the most controversial scriptures in the New Testament in our era. 
But it's in the Bible, it's in the New Testament, so let's talk about it. 211, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Well, there you go. Everybody just, half the room is leaving, walking out, goodbye, thank you very much. In our culture, I know this is very controversial, right? But part of what I want you to see is that God has a leadership role for a man. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. That's the key phrase there. Specifically, in this context, it's over your husband. To not take authority over your husband. Why? Because God has a plan and a purpose for the dad to be the leader of the family. So I know, again, that's controversial, right? But I also want to help you see that God has a plan and a purpose for men to be leaders. And that's why you can see from statistics when they are the ones involved and engaged in leading, the family does much better. And then it says, verse 13, Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and led him into sin. Now, what should have happened was the opposite. Adam should have stepped in and been the spiritual leader and protector and said, Eve, we're not doing this. But instead, he flipped it around and let Eve lead him into sin, and they both sinned. Adam was not deceived. Adam sinned by a decision against God. And Adam led the whole human race, therefore, into sin. But again, it's talking about flipping the arrangement of what Adam should have been doing. Instead, he didn't do it right. So God's plan for dads to be male, to be leaders. The third one, to be a father. Again, Genesis 1, we're going to go to verse 8. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Be a father, Adam. Be a father, Abraham. That's why Abraham was struggling so long. I want to be a father, but I don't have any children, Lord. How can I be a father without children? Now, we all have, I believe, an innate desire to be fruitful and multiply. Now, recognize this real quick. Yes, there's a general understanding for all of us to be fruitful and multiply. That doesn't mean every specific human being is supposed to have physical children. But we are all supposed to be involved in spiritually producing children. In fact, Paul, the great New Testament apostle, did not have physical children. That doesn't mean he didn't have any children. Let's jump ahead to 2 Timothy 1, 2. You can find that one wrong. 2 Timothy 1, 2. He writes to Timothy, and what does he say? To Timothy, my dear son. To Timothy, my dear son. Was Timothy his physical son? The answer is no. In fact, you go to Acts 16, verse 1. We see Paul was on a missionary journey. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. So that wasn't Paul. Paul wasn't Timothy's physical father. But the assumption here is that his father was a Greek, and his father did not lead him into faith. His father would have been on that side where he was not leading the family spiritually into the things of God. His mother did. In fact, if you go to 2 Timothy again, chapter 1, verse 5, a few verses later, you see, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. So he got his from his mother's side. And thank God for all the mothers who live the faith, pass on the faith, and prepare their children and grandchildren for the faith. And every Mother's Day, we honor that and acknowledge that and thank God for that. But we see here, he doesn't say anything about his father's faith or his grandfather's faith. So Paul says, I'll be your spiritual father, Timothy. I'll fill that role spiritually for you, and I will help you learn how to follow the faith. Not just from your mother's side, but also from a male perspective. And I believe that God has called all of us as men to be physical or spiritual father or both. And if we are a physical father, we're called to be both. We're called not only to physically father our children, we are called to spiritually father them, help them not just be born naturally, they help them be born spiritually, and then train them and teach them in the faith. Not all of us are called pastors or maybe Sunday school teachers or missionaries, evangelists, but we're all called to help somebody know Jesus and help somebody learn the faith. 
And God wants us to be fruitful in spiritual matters. God wants us to multiply in spiritual matters, as the book of Acts repeatedly says. And the Lord added daily to their number. And the church grew and multiplied. So we need spiritual fathers to help people get born again and help people learn the faith. So all of us are called to be, as males, a father, physically, spiritually, or both. Number four, work, labor, tend, produce, provide. Did I get enough words in there for you? <laughs> Work, labor, tend, produce, provide. It's the Brian Matthew Amplified Version. If you've ever read the Amplified Version of the Bible, it uses like five words for every word in there. Okay. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden, and gave him a job. And said, hey, start working. Now, thankfully, there was no sin at that time. It was a lot easier. It gets worse after the thorns and the thistles and all the sin curse comes in. But why would you work a garden? Why would you be a farmer? Why would you plant seed in the ground? You want something to be produced. Otherwise, don't plant anything. You'll get the same result. <laughs> the goal is to be productive. So just like a father, or just like a spiritual father, be fruitful and multiply, God wants us to do that with our work. To be fruitful, to multiply, to see a harvest come in, to be productive from what we're doing. To see something come of our work. And that's why it's frustrating for us sometimes when we work at something and we don't see a, a production, we don't see fruit, we don't see something increasing. But God has called us to be fruitful, to be productive, to work, and also to take care of it, or to tend it, or protect it. So, yes, I'm not an environmentalist, but we are stewards of the earth that God has given us. And we need to protect our earth, and we need to help it to be healthy. We don't want to exploit it and destroy it. We want to pro provide for it, tend it, protect it. So God has called us to be male, to be leaders, to be fathers, to work and labor and tend and produce and provide, to oversee animals. Genesis 2.18. The Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, after we read this, some of you are going to argue with this, right? Now, the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, brought them to see what the man would name them. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean he made the man first and then formed them. I believe they were both made on day six, but the man was made last. And then I believe that those that had been formed previously, he brought to the man. Genesis 2.20. The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds and the sky, the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And some of you are saying, man's best friend was a dog, right? <laughs> That's all I needed. Well, before... Sin entered in. Obviously, things were a little different. But I want you to understand, yeah, it's great to have an animal. Because you're over that animal. You train an animal do anything you want to do, right? And that animal will be trained. That animal will obey. That animal will do what it says. But you get another human being involved. And they're on a level of equality. They're not going to respond the same way as that animal does. <laughs> you can't train a husband like a dog, right, ladies? <laughs> Animals will be trained to respond, but we are called to oversee animals. Some of us are called directly to oversee animals, maybe having livestock, maybe having herds, maybe having cattle. Abraham and David were both shepherds. They were called directly to do that. Some of us will have it in the form of pets, and that's one of the reasons we like having some animals around. Some of us don't have any, but in general, there's this call to oversee animals as humans and specifically as men but there's another type of helper that's needed adam doesn't just need animals adam needs a human companion look again genesis 2 18 the lord said it's not good for the man to be alone i will make a helper suitable for him and again with the animals no suitable helper was found so instead 221 the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, like my sermons. <laughs> yes, <Pastor. laughs> and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place of flesh, and the Lord made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. He brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman. She was taken out of man, both equally made in the image of God. 
And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So that's God's plan and purpose. And again, it doesn't mean every man is called to be married to a woman. But it does mean all of us are called to human companionship. In um, Outdoor Skills, and my kids are doing through 4-H, they talked about the rule of threes. Said you've got to have three minutes, you've got to have air, oxygen. Three hours, you've got to have shelter. Three days, you've got to have water. Three weeks, you've got to have food. What's the last one? Three months, you've got to have a human companion. I mean, solitary confinement is intended to be torture to somebody. Now, the first day or two, you might enjoy that solitary. Finding some peace and quiet. Finding that good little respite. And it's good for us to have times we get alone. Even Jesus did that. But after a while, it begins to harm us. We are created for companionship. We are created for relationship. God created one man, one woman to be married in one covenant. But also, God created us to have family members. God created us to have siblings. God created us to have friends, other people that we can relate to. And obviously the ultimate family is the family of God, the church. God's designed all of us spiritually to be born again and not just live an isolated life in Christ, to be born again into the family of God. And each one of us is a part or a member of the body. So Genesis 2, 24, we are called to be part of the body the two becoming one, and then the body of Christ coming together as one in Christ. Finally, men were created to obey God. Genesis 2, 16, Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, you will certainly die. And that's exactly what Adam did. Genesis 3, 1, the serpent spoke to the woman. Did God really say... And this is always a temptation of Satan in every generation. Did God really say he'll want to get you to doubt the word of God, not believe the word of God, and or directly rebel against the word of God? And I believe most times we don't want to believe the word of God because we don't want to obey the word of God. I believe those go together. Oftentimes we want to find ways not to believe because we don't want to really obey. I'd rather live this way, so I don't really want to believe what the scripture actually says. So did God really say, we start coming up with reasons why we can disobey what God said. And instead, Genesis 3.17, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, command you not to, you must not eat it, cursed is the ground. And all of a sudden, all the curses start coming into this world. And now each of these seven things are attacked by Satan and don't operate like they should. So we're not uh, the leaders, we're not the fathers, we're not working, we're not producing, we're not being the things we're supposed to be because of sin that has now entered into the world and tried to change those things. But God's plan was to redeem man by man. It was always a man and a man. Genesis 3.15, I'm going to put enmity, he's talking now to the woman, between you, or the, the, the devil, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he, he, the male, will crush your head. He will strike his heel. I've got a plan for a man to come from a woman, and that man is going to be the Savior. Genesis 3, 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and the garments of skin was to indicate it would be a man and it would be blood. It would be a man's blood that would save the world. So Romans 5, 17, for if by the trespass of one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, so all of our problems came from one man and one man's sin, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Our answer comes through a man, our problems came from a man. Romans 5, 18. Just as one man's trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, one man's righteous act resulted in justification for all people. 19. Just as the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteous. So Jesus, the one man, came to save us from what Adam, the one man, got us into. So I would encourage you today, number one, to do what Ephesians 6 says. 
to honor your father and or your spiritual father. Again, remembering Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then Ephesians 6, 2, honor your father and mother. The obedience ends when we become adults, but the honoring never does. We don't have to obey our parents when we're adults, but we have to continue to honor them. So if you have a mother or, or father that is still alive today, we are to continue to honor them. If not, we can thank God for them and say a prayer today to thank God for our father and the role that he played, or maybe our spiritual father and the role that he played in our life. But if you have a father who's alive today, I would encourage you to do something to show that honor. And then it'll go well with you. And you will enjoy the blessings of the Lord on your life. Then number two here, this is for the fathers. If you are a male, pray about and commit to your role to be a holy father. I would encourage you to look at those seven things and say, which one of these, God, are you calling me to focus on right now? Which one of these seven things have you called me to do that I should focus on this week? Which one of those do you want me to use for your glory and your purposes? Father, Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, we have a role, an important role, a significant role in helping the next generation to live out the faith. I know a lot of people are concerned about where we're at right now as a culture. What's the answer? Yes, obviously the answer is God. Obviously the answer is Jesus Christ. But the answer of how it's going to change is the fathers. The fathers being holy fathers who will lead holy families who will then change the next generation. That's how it's going to work. So I would encourage you, if you are a man, to help train up that next generation so that they can follow the ways of the Lord and they can start going in the right direction. Number three, and this may be some of you here, might be somebody online, if you have experienced trauma from a father. I'm not saying, hey, your dad did some things wrong. Which one didn't? <laughs> right? Every father has made mistakes. Every father has done some things wrong. But I'm saying if your father has caused some hurt in your life, maybe when I talk about abuse, that's what you've experienced. Maybe you have been, maybe your father was completely absent. Maybe your father did neglect you. Maybe your father caused some hurt and damage to your life. Now I encourage you to seek help from God and seek help from a counselor about that. Let God work in that area to heal you. Okay? Yes, we're full of sin in this world right now, so there's a good chance some of you didn't get the experience that you should have had with your fathers. And if you need it, get help from God, get help from a counselor, and let God to start working that healing. And finally, number four, for all of us here today, we can receive perfect love from our perfect Father, God. We have a perfect Father. Our earthly fathers are not perfect. But we have a perfect Father who is. And we can all receive perfect love from Him. And Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms. In my Father's house are many mansions. We can spend forever in our eternal Father's house with His perfect love and the perfect blessings and benefits that He has for us. So, if you haven't been born again into the family of God, I encourage you today. And if you have, remember who you are. You are a child of your heavenly Father. Let's pray. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We've talked about a lot of different things about men and their roles. God, we know you had a purpose for creating men. And I pray today that those of us who are men in this room, that we would first receive you as Lord and Savior. We have first asked forgiveness for our sins. And we have first received the new birth in our own heart so that we could have the Heavenly Father be our Father. And then secondly, we would be doing our role to help others to know you, to help others to be born again, to help others experience the goodness of God. And Lord, for all of us, we may have had some experiences that maybe wasn't good from our Father. Maybe we got hurt, abused, neglected. Maybe something happened that caused trauma in our life. And I pray, God, you bring healing today. Help us to seek out help to get that healing. 
and to remember that you're the perfect father and you have a blessing for us, Lord. You can heal our hurt and wounds and help us to move forward. We may need to forgive some of the things that have been done to us, Lord. God, if we have a father on this earth today, I pray that we would reach out to them, that we would honor them in some way and thank them. If we have a spiritual father on the earth today, I pray we'd reach out to them and thank them for taking that role. God, if we don't, we remember them now and we say thank you for the life that they had. Thank you for the influence they had on our lives. Thank you for the time we shared together. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to stand together now and sing our final hymn about the faith of our Father. Thank you.